Okay, understanding your religion, the seven major doctrines that define the Christian faith. We are uh, moving on to the uh, doctrine of the divinity of Christ, the first part of this. So we're on to uh, another major uh, doctrine today, what the Bible says about Jesus. So in our last session I explained the doctrine of inspiration of the Bible. That was the first major doctrine, the doctrine of inspiration of the Bible. And you know, we talked about how the Bible was written, why we believe it comes from God, and so on and so forth. Today we're going to examine the second great Christian doctrine, and that concerns the divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of theories about this, about Jesus, who He is. Some say He was a Jewish rabbi, a prophet of some kind, a ghost or spirit, even those type of doctrines appeared in the first century that He, was, you know, he wasn't really human, He was just an apparition of, of, of some sort. Uh, I've even heard people say He was an alien or some kind of advanced life form that you know, came to, to earth. We as Christians, however, we believe that He is the divine Son of God and we get this description of Him from the Bible itself. So uh, we've studied what the Bible says about itself and what does it say about itself. You know, the first major doctrine, inspiration of Scripture, um, we, we, we said the Bible says about itself that it's, that it's inspired. So uh, what else does the Bible say? Well, it says something about Jesus. And so the very first place we're going to look at is the Bible itself to say, what, is it, what does it say about the Lord? Well, first of all, it says that this is the central theme of the Bible itself. Okay, works well, there we go. The um, inspired Bible is about Jesus Christ. He's the main theme. He's the main character spoken of in, in Scripture. Uh, he's the main point of all the books of the Bible. The different parts of the Bible serve to explain different things about Him and His interaction with us. So if somebody says, well, what's the Bible about? Boy, you're thinking about prophecies and you're thinking about the Levit uh, Levitical priesthood and you're thinking, well, what do I say? You know, just one thing. The Bible is about Jesus Christ. It's about Him. For example, the Old Testament is really the story about the creation of the world and then how God prepared for His coming by the forming of the Jewish nation. That's really what the Old Testament is about. All the events setting up a human and historical stage for the eventual appearance of Jesus as a man in the world. You know, Jesus was to come, the Son of God was to take on human flesh. But what culture was he going to be? Was he going to be, you know, I've said it in the past, was he going to be Polish? <laughs> you know, what was he, who was he going to be? What kind of culture would he have? And so God creates a culture. He creates a people. And He gives them a culture and a history. He gives them laws. He gives them a religion. He gives them a land. He gives them a history. He gives them everything. For what purpose? So that when He appears as a man, he puts on the cloak of humanity through the culture of Judaism. And the Old Testament is simply the story of how God created that culture, created that history, gave that culture its laws. So the Old Testament tells this story through the eyes and the words of the Jewish prophets and leaders and kings. Um, the four gospels, are the eyewitness accounts of his life and ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension back to heaven. Again, the story recorded and preserved by men who were with him for years and who knew him intimately. What are the gospels about? Well, they're about Jesus. They're about his life and death and resurrection. The rest of the New Testament written by other apostles show how his followers established the Christian church according to his instructions. In addition to this, there are teachings to help followers or disciples live their Christian lives in every generation, every environment. You know, we said last week in, in our lesson that some religions become extinct because they just can't keep up. <laughs> they can't adapt. 
you know, to, to changing times and, 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 and the greater knowledge of individuals and so on and so forth, science. But Christianity has, why? Because, well, because Jesus is the Son of God and His religion adapts to every culture. So we could go anywhere in the Bible to find out about Jesus concerning the, the promise of His coming, the preparation for His appearances, the circumstances of His miraculous birth, the content of His teachings, the details of His death and resurrection, the people who knew Him personally and spread His teachings throughout the world. You can go anywhere. But I don't think we would have time in a single lesson to do this. That's, that's the problem. You know, we, we've said we're going to do the seven major doctrines. This, this could be a very long course. So we have to kind of you know, cut it off here and there and, and compression. What we can do, however, is to focus in on what the Bible says about who Jesus is. This is the first step in establishing His divinity. This is actually the most important question about Jesus Christ and we'll see what three individuals contained in the Bible say about Him. You know, who is Jesus? That's always the question. You know, people say to me, people of another faith, I don't mean another expression of Christianity, I mean another faith, you know, Hinduism, Buddhists, so on and so forth. When we were in Montreal, much more, you know, much more culturally diverse society in Montreal than say Oklahoma City. Okay. I mean, in, in, in Montreal, a church of 100 people, we had at least 18 different nationalities, languages, cultures represented among 100 people. Here we have 400 people and we don't have that many cultures. So a very diverse culture and also very diverse religiously as well. And so when I was talking to someone who wasn't a Christian, you know, and they were saying, well, we're all the same thing, you know, well, you know, it's pretty much, we're all going to the same place. My go-to question always was, okay, who is Jesus? That was my go-to question. That's the line in the sand. Never mind, you know, well, you go to church, we, we have a mosque or we have a, a holy place, you have holy books, we have holy books. Yeah, it's all the same. No, 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 it's not, I would say. Who is Jesus? Ah, Jesus, yeah, yeah. I actually did a man on the street interview for one of our television programs there. And I went out downtown to St. Catherine Street, busy, busy street, you know, thousands of people, and I just stopped people and say, do you mind if I ask you a question for a religious prayer? Sure, you know, who is Jesus? Oh man, <laughs> I got so many. Well, he's some sort of prophet. Well, he is a good man, you know, and so on and so forth. One guy just scratched his head and he says, you got another question? <laughs> because he didn't want to answer that one. So who is Jesus? That's you know, the subject of this lesson here in establishing the doctrine of the divinity of Christ. Now remember, we're asking the question, who is Jesus according to the Bible? Not just what we think or feel or learn from a book or a movie or a teacher of some kind. Since most of the direct and eyewitness accounts about Him are in the New Testament portion of the Bible, let's go there to ask about Him. Now we know that thousands of people saw and heard Jesus speak and teach even do miracles. There's no doubt of his existence because historians of that era write about him and his ministry. So this idea, oh, that's just somebody that Christians made up. No, no. Historically speaking, Jesus existed. Josephus Flavius, who was a Jewish historian who wrote about that particular period, he was not a follower of Jesus. Actually, he was a Pharisee. But he mentions Jesus and Christianity in general in his historical works. Why? Because, well, because the, you know, Jesus lived during his time when he was alive and Christianity as a movement began during his time and he wrote about it as an observer of history. And we find out a lot of things about the early Christian era from Josephus. So history, not the Bible, writes that Jesus was a Jewish man born into a humble family who lived in Israel approximately 2,000 years ago. We know that. He began his ministry by claiming that he was the Jewish Messiah or Savior. And he was eventually arrested and executed by the Roman government at the insistence of the Jewish leaders who accused him of causing civil unrest by his teachings. That's a kind of very cold and clinical 
historical view of Jesus. Historically speaking, just from the history books, they say that eventually his followers established the Christian church based on his teachings and their claim of his resurrection. So this is what history books teach about the facts of Jesus' life. Now there were others, however, who actually followed Jesus as his special disciples and they too recorded their accounts of Jesus. And it is from these writers whose records form the New Testament that we can still establish a much more comprehensive picture of who Jesus really was. So for the sake of our study, we're going to examine three of these men and their writings and their descriptions of Jesus. In other words, we're going to look at the witness of the apostles. Who did they say he was? So the first one, of course, is Peter. Who is Jesus? So we know that Peter, of course, was a fisherman by trade and along with his brother Andrew had a family business. Uh, he was the first, quote, apostle called by Jesus to follow him on a full-time basis. He was to hear all of Jesus' teachings, witness his miracles, later on be a leader in establishing the church and finally die as a martyr in Rome, claiming to the very end that what he heard and what he saw was true. So during Jesus' ministry, Jesus asked the apostles, including Peter, based on what they saw him say and do, who did they think he was? And Peter answered without hesitation, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16. So you know, what's the importance of this? Well, even while Jesus was alive, the Bible says that Peter believed and declared him to be the divine Son of God, even while he was alive. Later on, after Jesus was executed, Peter describes the things that he saw with his own eyes as he rebukes the Jews for their hard hearts and their disbelief. In, um, in Acts chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, this is Peter talking, he says, but you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. So there's absolutely no doubt as to what Peter saw and believed and wrote. We can't twist that to mean, like you can disbelieve that. You can say, well, I don't believe what Peter is writing here, but you can't say he didn't write it. You can't say he didn't say that, okay? Now there is much written about Peter in the New Testament, and Peter himself writes to the books or the epistles contained in this part of the Bible, but these two passages that we just read summarize well what Peter thought about Jesus based on what he experienced. So somebody you know, could talk to Peter and say to Peter the Apostles, who is Jesus? Who, who do you say that He is? So Peter says that Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah, the Savior promised by the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus was the one sent by God to save mankind. As a Jew, knowing the prophecies of the Messiah to come, Peter declares, okay, those prophecies were fulfilled in this person, Jesus. Secondly, Peter also concluded that Jesus was divine based on what he heard Jesus say and what he saw him do. And thirdly, Peter saw Jesus executed by Roman soldiers and then saw him after God raised him from the dead. As I said before, Peter never changed or denied this witness. He was uh, threatened, he was imprisoned, and finally sent to his death for saying these things. All he had to do was recant. You know, if all he said about Jesus was that he was a good man, and they were going to kill him for that, he could say, well, okay, I'll, you know, maybe he was a pretty good man. You know. But he was saying this wild thing, you know, that Jesus rose from the dead. You know. That would be pretty easy to step back from. Say, well, I was just kidding. I was just really zealous. I wanted this Christianity thing to work. You know, so I, I just said he rose from the dead. But he never stepped back from that, even under the threat of, of death. So when we want to know who is Jesus, the Bible, through Peter's words, says that he's the Son of God, the Savior, and he is resurrected from the dead. So that's one eyewitness. 
Let's look at another one here. Who is Jesus? This time let's ask Thomas the Apostle. Another apostle we know less about was Thomas. He's the one referred to, of course, as Doubting Thomas because he wanted proof of Jesus' resurrection before he would believe. Now what he says about Jesus is interesting because of this very fact. He demanded proof before he would continue to believe. He knew Jesus and like the other apostles had lived and worked with Jesus for three years. He saw the miracles, he heard the teachings, and he witnessed Jesus die on the cross. He was convinced Jesus was dead. So brutal and final was his execution at the hands of the Roman soldiers. You know, the Romans, they didn't botch executions. They knew very well how to kill people, especially people who weren't fighting back. <laughs> when the other apostles reported that they had seen Jesus resurrected and alive again, Thomas was skeptical and he refused. He's not again, he said. You know, I, I was in with you guys. You know, I was in 100% and they went and killed him. So I'm, you know, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. So in the Gospel of John, we read about Jesus' confrontation with Thomas and how Thomas is encouraged to believe. In John uh, chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 24, it says, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here with your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Note that what this exchange teaches us about Jesus, remember the whole point of this lesson is, what do we learn from the Bible and from specifically the eyewitnesses, what do we learn about Jesus? Because we're answering the question, what does the Bible say about Jesus? Okay. So first of all, we learn that Thomas believes that Jesus is actually risen from the dead. We learned that from this discourse. We also learned that Thomas acknowledges that Jesus is God, not just a, a prophet or a teacher or a holy man, but God Himself. We learned that the apostle demonstrates that Jesus is worthy of not only belief, but worship as well. Thomas, in calling Jesus Lord, indicates that Jesus has authority over him. So once again, a very short passage, but one where the Bible sets forth important facts about who Jesus is. He's divine. He's the object of belief and worship. He's the Lord over us. You know, people are free to choose whether they believe this or not, but the fact remains that this is what the Bible teaches about Jesus, and that's what we're getting across today. Okay. So let's look at a, one, one other witness, shall we? Just to kind of round out our, you know, our, uh, our list of individuals who, and what they say about Jesus. This time we'll talk to Paul the Apostle. Perhaps no one other than Jesus himself articulates in more detail the character and person of Jesus Christ than Paul the Apostle. I mean, it's Paul the, it's Paul the Apostle that writes the book of Colossians that goes into great detail about who Jesus is and His divinity and His relationship to the Father and you know, the, the, the magnificence of His person. It's not Peter that writes about that, and yet Peter was with Jesus for years, Jesus in His human form. Paul, who never met Jesus like in person, and yet he's the one that really writes about Jesus, the Son of God in Colossians and in other places too. You know, Romans, for example, but Romans is more a theoretical about salvation and so on and so forth. But Colossians, oh my, lots of insight there, inspired insight about who Jesus is. So Paul was a Jew, an early persecutor of the Christian church. As a Pharisee, he was part of the ruling class in the Jewish society of Jesus' day. He was a religious zealot for Judaism who had obtained a mandate from the ruling council of Jewish leaders to wage a campaign 
of persecution against Christians for what purpose? To discourage them, to wipe this thing out. We don't want this thing to get going, it's, it's trouble. And in recounting his own experience, Paul describes the meeting with Jesus Christ that changed his life. Acts 22, he says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. As also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify, from them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law, and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time I looked up at him and he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And thus began the conversion and mission of one of the most prolific of Jesus' apostles. We know both from history and the Bible that Paul went on to preach and establish the Christian religion throughout the Roman Empire. He was eventually imprisoned by the emperor Nero and executed in Rome in 67 AD on account of his role as a Christian leader. Paul, the adversary of the church, the one who initially denied who Jesus was, ended up giving his life for his faith in Christ. Imagine, talk about a turnaround. In his writings, we have a very dynamic description of Jesus and his exalted position. In Colossians verses 15 to 18, he writes, and this is Paul now. He says, when he says he, he's talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. Now I want you to know what Paul specifically says about who Jesus is. Remember, we're answering the question, you know, we're interviewing these men here, uh, Paul and Thomas, now we're interviewing uh, P, uh, Paul, and we're saying to him, well, who is Jesus? Well, what he's just said is the following. He's the image of God. In other words, he is the visible image of the invisible God. When you see Jesus, you are looking at God. He says, that Jesus existed before creation. In other words, He exists before time, which means like God, He is eternal. He says that He is supreme over creation, and that tells us that He has the authority of God. He tells us that He is the agent, He's not only supreme over creation, He's the agent of creation. Everything in the material and spiritual world was created by Him, and for him. Talk about an exalted view of Jesus. He goes on to say that he is the head of the church. And this is important. Jesus is the only leader of the church in heaven and on earth. He does not share this role with anyone. 
He is not co-leader with some other person, a man or a religious leader. He is not co-leader with somebody else of the church on earth. He's the head of the church in heaven and he's the head of the church on earth. Now local congregations have leaders, yes, of course. The Bible teaches us that, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, for example, several places in the book of Acts. We have elders, you know. They're leaders of the congregation, local congregations. But they're not, quote, leaders of the church, the worldwide church. Only one leader of the worldwide church. That's Jesus Christ. And also, He leads those who will resurrect. Another way of saying He is eternal by saying that He leads in the future, meaning He's already in the future. Okay? So these things are not the only things that Paul says about Jesus, but we can see from these that Paul was proclaiming Jesus as the divine Son of God based on his own experiences and knowledge of Christ and his teachings. So we've reviewed three of the eyewitnesses who describe and explain in the Bible who they believed Jesus to be. All right. Now, this leaves us with one last person to examine, and that would be Jesus Himself. You know, one description of Jesus would be incomplete if we didn't examine at least a few things that He said about His own true identity. So here are three things, this does not exhaust the list, of course, three things that Jesus said about Himself to three different individuals. First, his conversation with the Samaritan woman. In a conversation with a woman while traveling through her town, Jesus answers her question about who is the true Messiah. I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. You know, to those persons who say to you, where does Jesus claim anything? You know, where does He say He's the Son of God or the Messiah? Well, yeah, John 4, 25, that's where He says it. And He says it to a Samaritan woman. I mean, that's so amazing. You know, men did not speak to women who they didn't, were not part of their family in public to begin with. Jewish men didn't do that. And women did not approach men they did not know to speak to them, to start a conversation, certainly not one who was a rabbi. And secondly, Jewish men did not speak to Samaritans, period, let alone a Samaritan woman. And yet Jesus declares to this woman, I am He, I am, I am the Messiah. So He describes Himself as the Savior spoken of by the Jews. All right. We looked at what Peter said, now let's look at what Jesus says to Peter, okay? In response to what Peter has already said about him, in um, uh, Matthew 16, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the uh, living God. And Jesus said to him, meaning to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barhona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Note that Jesus confirms what Peter says about him and even goes on to reveal how Peter came to know this. <laughs> yeah, what you're saying is true, Peter, and I'm, I'm going to tell you that you wouldn't know that by yourself. My Father revealed that to you. All right? One other group, the apostles. After His resurrection and appearance to over 500 disciples, Jesus gives His apostles and future disciples their mission. Famous passage. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Note that in this passage, Jesus claims exclusive divine authority over all. He says, all authority, where? In heaven and on earth. I, I think that includes everything, don't you? <laughs> all authority. Given to Him by who? The Father. So these are only a few of the things that are recorded 
concerning Jesus, but from these we see some of the things that the Bible teaches about him aside from being a true historical figure. So Josephus and others tell us that Jesus actually lived and died and so on and so forth, okay? But the Bible gives us even more information, just summarizing what we've talked about today in like 20, 30 minutes. He, who is Jesus according to the New Testament? Well, He's the Jewish Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the Lord God Himself, divine. When you're talking to Him, you're talking to God. He is resurrected from the dead. He's an eternal being. He's the agent of creation. He's the head of the church. He is the supreme authority over heaven or in heaven and on earth. Now I could go on and on about what the Bible actually says about Jesus, but I'm going to close this lesson with a quote from the Gospel of John who faced a similar dilemma trying to list all the things he actually heard and saw Jesus do. It's actually a problem. There's so much. So faced with the mountain of information in front of him, John writes in the 20th and 21st chapters of his gospel record the following. Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have uh, life in His name. And then in another place he writes, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So it's not like we don't have enough information. <laughs> it's not like the information is sparse. You know, in the New Testament we have to really you know, hunt for stuff. You know. The problem is we have too much information. The apostles had too much information you know, they couldn't get it all into the record, so they selected certain things and, 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 and condensed it into their records. And the goal was what? Well, we're going to give you enough information so that you can believe. Believe what? Well, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Is that not the same confession? Did anybody here make some different type of confession when they were baptized? You know, that you were uh, New York Yankee fans? Is that what you confessed when you were baptized? You know, everybody. You know, uh, when I was baptized, the question was put to me maybe a little differently, but my answer was, yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Or some people answer, yes, I believe that He is God. Or yes, I believe He's the Messiah. Or yes, I believe He's my Savior. Or, you know, but we're all making the same confession because we're answering the question, you know, Michael Mazzalongo, who is Jesus? And in front of the angels, and there were only two witnesses that night, the preacher and one of the deacons, when I was baptized, on a very cold November night, we didn't have, we didn't have a heater for the baptistry in Montreal, so it's, the water was really, that's what I remember, it was very cold. I answered that question. Yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And it's the question all of you are going to answer. And tonight we're going to baptize, Lord willing, we're going to baptize a young, you know, a young girl who wants to be a Christian, who wants to go to heaven. And that little girl, I'm going to ask her the very same question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Imagine, eight years old, 80 years old, same question, same answer. 2,000 years, millions and millions upon people, always, always the same answer. Who is Jesus? He's the Son of the living God. All right, next time, we're going to continue. We're on the second major doctrine in the Christian faith, which is the divinity of Christ. Today, this was lesson number one in establishing that idea, the divinity of Christ, the New Testament witness of that. Next week, we're going to add more proofs. You know, we're going to build that case up. So we're going to do part two of this particular doctrine, who is Jesus, the divinity of Christ. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.